Hey there, we are finally live. We had some sound difficulties. We had technical difficulties. We should be streaming now and it's hard for me. Yes, okay, now I see it. So apologize for the delay here. Um, so happy to join you on a Friday um, from home. I have been recovering from a procedure, still a little swollen, by the way, um, if you see that in my face, but um, I'm still here reading and chatting about what we're learning and doing. My name is Julie Hirschberg, the owner and founder of Reactive Therapy and Wellness here in the Los Angeles area. And we've been talking about functional neurologic disorders um, a lot lately because this is what we do a lot of. Uh, it's what we're learning a lot about. We are teaching. We have a weekend course coming up in October. We're doing a free webinar tomorrow. So this is on our minds. <laughs> um, I'm just putting the final touches on some of what we're doing for our webinar, which I'm really excited about. It's tomorrow, September 18th at uh, nine in the morning. And Today, I really wanted to dive a little deeper into Oliver Sacks and his functional neurologic disorder. So we're going to talk um, a little bit about the timeline of the event. So um, his traumatic injury, how he described the recovery process and some of the clues to the functional neurologic disorder, some of his insights on the walking as an automatic process, and then his thoughts and reflections about um, the diagnosis. Because of course, when he wrote this book, when this happened, there was not a diagnosis of functional neurologic disorder. So this was not something that um, he could have identified with at the time, right? So let's start with that. Now, yesterday I talked um, a little bit about his injury. Um, also talked a little um, story about Proust as well, who was presumed to potentially have a functional neurologic disorder. Um, so famous historical people with functional neurologic disorder, who knew? Um, so I'm gonna give a little overview and somebody actually asked me yesterday, well, like how long did this recovery process take? And it's funny, you know, reading the book and reading, um, by the way, um, Oliver Sacks wrote about this. Um, so his experience of this physical injury and then this functional neurologic disorder that took place afterwards in a leg to stand on. And I'm so glad he wrote this book. And um, somebody asked me yesterday, well, how long was his recovery? And so he had his injury. He was in the hospital. He ended up in a convalescent center. This was over the course of um, several months um, for recovery. And then if you read in the footnotes, it wasn't actually until four years later that he even had an EMG on his leg to show some of the nerve damage. So this really was uh, a prolonged course. But it, if you read the book, which I highly recommend, you'll see that there are moments where he can move again freely and automatically that literally occur like in a day, in a moment of you know, uh, listening, kind of hearing music in his head and being able to walk automatically. Um, but the course of his recovery, because he was also recovering from uh, physical injury and surgery and ner uh, nerve injury, the course of that recovery was um, over a long course of time. And he has really beautiful descriptions of it in the book. Um, I'll read a couple of things uh, to today, but it really is pretty um, amazing what, what he went through and what happened. So here's the story. So he was hiking in Norway when he sustained this injury. So as I mentioned uh, yesterday in my video, he's on an isolated mountain path by himself. He stumbled upon a bowl. He was fleeing and he um, fell. And um, and he, had, he sustained a severe injury. Um, he was on a sharp cliff of a rock too, um, and really felt like this was it, um, that he was very near to death um, at this time. He was eventually rescued by reindeer hunters, thank goodness. Um, he was put in a temporary cast, 
went to the hospital in London. He had a, uh, an operation um, to repair. He had an involved quadriceps tendon. Um, and um, and then went through the recovery process where, you know, he was um, feverish, he was in shock, he was delirious, um, he was in severe pain, he was sick, and um, really experiencing much of what many people do with um, a very severe and traumatic injury like that. And he reflects on this. It's, it's very clear that it was painful. Um, he had a lot of fear and a very distressing experience. So when we talk about um, some of those components of neuroplasticity that can contribute to a functional neurologic disorder, these are all part of that experience. And I talked a bit, a little bit about that yesterday. By the way, if you're on our newsletter, I send out all of our videos and I, um, will include links to the articles and things that I, that I talk about. Um, so as he, and he has these really lovely descriptions in the book of him with physical therapy too. A great physical therapist team is what it sounds like. And you know, immediately as he comes out and he's getting into physical therapy and starting to try to do isometric exercises, he's having this sense of detachment from his leg. Now he did have nerve injury. He did have sensory loss, which definitely leaves you feeling detached from your leg. Um, but he felt much more than that. Um, and he said something too. He had this feeling that I had forgotten something, something quite obvious, um, only it had slipped my mind. And that was kind of his a sense of feeling when he went to uh, contract his muscles. Um, and remember too, he's in a cast at this point. Um, so um, I, there's so much in this book. I like wrote down all of these, uh, these quotes. Um, one that I mentioned yesterday, he, he realized it was not just a lesion in my muscle, but a lesion in me. Um, and um, in himself, in his brain, in his thinking, right? So um, he experienced what many people with functional neurologic disorders experience, which is an intense feeling of disconnection from a paretic leg and um, from a leg without sensation too. So um, it, uh, disconnection, depersonalization. One of the things that he said as well, and I hear this um, also is he said, I could no longer remember having a leg. I could no longer remember how I had ever walked or climbed. And so um, I think, again, many people who have a traumatic injury um, can have that sense, and many people with functional neurologic disorder can have that sense as well, that that automatic and procedural memory has, has somehow vanished. Now, we know that it hasn't. It is there. It's in the brain, and it's blocked. And this is really a big part of recovery in functional neurologic disorders and was a big part of his recovery, which was, which is pretty awesome to, um, to hear him talk about. So one of the things that, um, I wanted to share today, uh, different than I did yesterday is to talk a little bit about, that recovery process that he went through, how he tapped into walking as an automatic process, what he learned from being around other people um, as he was in the convalescent hospital and um, the, the wisdom that they had. Um, and then some of his reflections actually on um, the potential diagnosis. So, um, in his recovery process. So again, as I mentioned, he had great physical therapist. And one of the first clues to him that he could indeed access some automatic movement was uh, in bed. He had an urge to, to move his leg and maneuver in bed and he could move it. But then when he went to show the nurse that he could move his leg on command with the attention to the leg, he couldn't move it. And that is precisely how we test out a functional neurologic disorder. Attention to the limb 
to the symptom actually causes some of that block. Um, and we talk about this in the pathophysiology of a functional neurologic disorder, a disruption in the tension and self-agency. So that attention can actually cause the block in the movement. And then the subsequent um, access to automatic movement. So I mentioned in the bed, and then when he was walking down the hall, initially helped by two physical therapists and crutches, he recalled, because um, he had listened to a tape player, um, um, Mendelssohn Concerto, he recalled this and he suddenly started walking in the rhythm with the movement with this song. And I think this was really, he describes it in a really lovely way. And um, that automatic movement was available to him, particularly when the attention wasn't on like how, let me move this leg, let me contract this muscle. So this is a, such a key piece for us as physical therapists, uh, because so many times when we're helping somebody after a surgery, after an injury, we are actually going contract this muscle or, you know, uh, activate your glutes here. It's a very internal body focus. And in Oliver Sacks' case, and in the case of other people, that can actually go awry, and we can't access some of that movement, uh, but we can access it in automatic ways. And that's a lot of what we do in therapy is find ways to unlock and have access to that automatic movement. So Oliver Sacks found it through music um, and repeated and repeated and repeated. Later on, after he was discharged from the convalescent hospital um, and finally out of the cast, he went to an orthopedic doctor. And I love this exchange that he has with the orthopedic doctor. The orthopedic doctor recommends um, that he go for a swim. He said, you're walking really stiff and um, I think you should go for a swim. Um, and again, how did, why did he say swim? This wasn't just random, like everybody should swim. He got to know Oliver Sacks and Oliver Sacks um, had been swimming since he was six months old. It came very naturally to him and he was competitive in it. And so this doctor being very smart actually called the lifeguard at the pool and said, I want you to like get in and race this guy in the pool. Knowing, I mean, this is very, very interesting and smart, um, knowing that this would help unlock some of his natural movement. And yes, it did. So he went, took a taxi, went to the pool, got in, this lifeguard's like, I'll race you. And then all of a sudden, boom, he's in race mode, unlocks his natural movement. He gets out of the pool and he's walking totally normally, not stiff legged. He's got way more. He only had 15 degrees of knee flexion. Every physical therapist is like, uh oh, that's not enough. He had full knee flexion after this. So hello, like no manual therapy, no nothing. He had his knee flexion. He could get up out of the pool. And then in addition, he saw that the bus he needed to catch was coming by. So he ran and he jumped on the bus. And here was somebody that never thought that they, he would be able to run and jump again ever. So huge ability of automatic movement that was unlocked. This doctor that he had that recommended this, brilliant, right? Like absolutely brilliant. Now, you know, I'm not suggesting that you go and um, like whisper to a lifeguard and set up this whole scenario. I was quite brilliant on the doctor's part. Um, but I think the challenge to us as therapists is to find the ways that we can unlock automatic movements for the person. And they're so person specific. And these are some of the things that I really loved in his um, discussion. Um, so he highlights a few things that many people with functional neurologic disorders experience. And one of those is initially with his orthopedic surgeon, the surgeon when doing rounds, when, when Oliver Sacks is explaining, like, I can't feel my leg and I feel very disconnected from it. 
the surgeon is like, there's nothing wrong with it. We, we did the surgery, the surgery was successful and there's nothing wrong. And I can't even tell you how many people have told me this, that somebody has said, well, there's nothing really wrong with you. So you should be fine. It's in your head then because our x-ray shows or our MRI shows or this or that show that nothing is wrong. And Oliver Sacks response to that of like, wow, he didn't, he also kind of describes this person not really looking him in the eyes or talking to him, but talking around him and talking to other people. This is such the experience that I have heard other people with functional neurologic disorders describe. And so if you're feeling kind of alone in that, if you have a functional neurologic disorder, you should read this because I think to hear Oliver Sacks describe that feeling very, very validating. Um, I think that would be, um, I often recommend this book. I recommend this to all healthcare providers, but I recommend it to a lot of patients as well. I think it's really, really fascinating. The other thing, so that was the story with the orthopedic doctor unlocking automatic movements. The other thing that I really, really loved is him, what he said about talking to the other people in the convalescent ward, many of whom had experienced some of the same um, symptoms as he had and the depersonalization. And this is what he said, what I found with him, and so he was talking about his roommate, I found with all of them, they were all much wiser than the doctors who treated them. There is among doctors, and he says in acute hospitals at least, a presumption of stupidity in their patients. Now, I'm not saying we all do this, that we all presume this, and that all doctors do, um, but this is his reflection on this. He said there's this presumption, and no one was stupid. No one is stupid except the fools who take them as stupid. Um, so he's kind of making a judgment call here on the other doctors. Um, and he really, really reflected on the wisdom that the patients brought. And this is another real take home point to me in not just working with functional neurologic disorders, but with, um, anyone is to me, the most wise person in the room. The one with the most knowledge is the person with the disorder. They know their body, they know the symptoms, they know how it responds. And so when we teach this, when we talk tomorrow in our webinar about a four-step process, Number one is listening. They're the source of knowledge and they're going to, people are going to tell you exactly what they need. Now you're going to help coach and you're going to kind of figure that out in terms of the neurology and the physiology and the sensory and the motor and all those systems, you're going to put it together. But boy, um, I love when he said that um, because I find that so true. And I think when we go in as healthcare providers, putting that person up as the expert in themselves, it makes a huge difference. We learn so much more and we can help them even more. So that is really one of the take-home messages um, for me. And this was another thing that he said, hello PTs. When he was starting um, physical therapy at the convalescent center, um, he said the therapist was affirmative and profoundly encouraging, giving me the feeling that I might hope for a virtually complete recovery. I can't tell you how important this is in, in, in many things, but in a functional neurologic disorder where we know that people can have a complete recovery, um, it is our duty and our job to help people understand that. Um, so very important. I want to read just a couple other pieces. I'm sorry, I could read you the whole book. But um, one of the things, um, uh, uh, the last important piece that he said about the doctor. So remember the story of the doctor where he went and uh, had him jump in the pool and swim and his automatic movement was back. This is what he said about him. He said, um, he gave me the sense that he was interested in me, me as a person, 
no less than as a problem. And he seemed to have all the time in the world, though I knew he was one of the most sought after men. Again, this comes back to the step one in our functional movement disorders made simple, listening being interested in the person as a person, um, not a problem. I think this is huge, particularly in people who have been looked at as a problem by many other healthcare practitioners. So um, this was just yet another, another piece that really stood out to me and a take home, a lesson learned from Oliver Sack. What worked for him works for many people with functional neurologic disorders. So he recognizes that too. So I think in many ways in this book, Oliver Sacks is telling us like what, what kind of treatment is really, really beneficial in functional neurologic disorders. And it's the type that puts the person at the center, that they were interested in knowing them in unlocking the automatic movement that's available to them. Now, in his time, they didn't have functional neurologic disorder um, as, as a diagnosis. And he ended up not really having a diagnosis for what had happened, but he had a lot of reflections on how it had occurred and then also how he recovered from it. And so I think we can learn a lot from that. And we can continue to be encouraged that this would be accessible to us um, and accessible to helping people with functional neurologic disorders. So thank you so much for letting me share. Um, you know, I've been kind of obsessed with this book. So two days in a row of videos on this book, but so many lessons to learn. So thank you for coming on this journey with me again. Um, there is an article um, by John Stone actually reviewing the book as well and, um, and some take home messages. I'm going to put a link to that in our newsletter. Also the story of Proust in our newsletter um, and a link to our free webinar, which is tomorrow. I'm so excited. So um, thank you again for joining me. Join our newsletter um, so that you can get all of these things in your email box. And I will see you again next week. Thank you.